Hi everyone, welcome to the first part of our four part series. My name is Rick Mini and I am the Community Outreach Liaison at Raksha Inc. Raksha is a Georgia based nonprofit that works for healing, empowerment, and justice for survivors of violence. Um, for this, this April, for National Sexual Assault Awareness Month, we're doing a series about uh, South Asian students in the Performing Arts and Dance Network. Um, talking about sexual assault, how we can support survivors, and how we can eradicate this issue. Uh, thank you, Redehi, for being with me today. Um, just to start, could you introduce yourself and then talk about how you came to address sexual assault at DDN? Absolutely. So my name is Baby. I am 26 years old, and I'm from South Carolina. I currently work in healthcare administration, um, and on this side, I am a journalist, author, and radio host. Um, but the way I kind of got involved in all of this is unfortunately from a personal experience. So um, while I was on the dance circuit, I was assaulted. And this was back in 2014. And so this is when the conversation around, you know, sexual violence, harassment, all of that wasn't happening. Um, this is when people kind of would rather you know, shove it under the rug, kind of forget about it, act like it didn't happen. Um, and, you know, until recently, like, that's been the culture of, you know, the community, unfortunately. Um, but I think I was one of those people that at one point said, enough is enough. Um, I'm not staying quiet anymore. I don't know about the rest of you guys, but I can't, you know, sit sit around and watch what happened to me um, happen to other people. So that's how I kind of got um, involved in, you know, speaking out against sexual violence in the um, uh, performing arts community. Mm -hmm. I'm actually a part of the SBR Task Force, um, which is a nonprofit that is going to be addressing the um, issue of sexual violence in the uh, performing arts community and the way we're really trying to tackle this is really by looking at it um, in a few different ways um, specifically accountability and survivor support systems um, those are our you know main goals through this organization is how do we keep people accountable and how do we support um, survivors um in in your opinion like what do you think are like the factors that lead to like the dance circuit being an unsafe space you know i i think it's a combination of things i don't necessarily think it's one thing in general um one thing that i will say is that unfortunately people kind of whether that's based on you know talent whether that's based on them being friends with the perpetrator a lot of times what I find is that when someone is assaulted, people try to justify the perpetrator and why they did what they did instead of taking that time to actually support the survivor. And to me, that is ridiculous. Um, I don't care how talented you are. I don't care how you know well-liked you are. If you assault someone, if you harass someone, you should not have a, you know, free pass to say what you want, do what you want, and get away with it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, unfortunately, like, with, with this whole issue, it's a reflection of society, unfortunately, because a lot of times in, you know, outside the dance circuit, you know, unfortunately, people aren't held accountable for this. And people get away with it. And it's always, question, the questions always go towards the survivor. It's never towards the perpetrator. And, you know, I think it, it has a lot to do with, you know, uh, I want people to reframe how they think about this instead of, you know, pointing the finger at the victim first. Ask the perpetrator why they did what they did. Ask them what justifies them doing what they did you know and so I think at the very like core of it it's 
these really skewed views on popularity, um, very skewed views on what constitutes um, sexual violence and assault and harassment and everything, and just concepts of those of that nature. I think that's what really kind of perpetuates this type of behavior. Mm -hmm. So um, in your experience or in what you know, like, what was the response? Like, if somebody comes out as a, a survivor, like, what measures are there to, like, ensure their safety? What's lacking? So unfortunately, until recently, and I, and by recently, I mean, probably the last year, year and a half, maybe, um, there were no measures in place. Um, the only way that, you know, any sort of measures kind of came out were after a very reputed dance team was, you know, found to be having a lot of perpetrators on their team. And that's when people started standing up. And like I said, this was un maybe a year, a year and a half ago. Mm -hmm. So you know, back when I was on the circuit, and this was back in 2014, um, there was nothing, like absolutely nothing. Um, no sort of response, no sort of, you know, support system for survivors. There was nothing back then. Um, in my own experience, you know, when I brought up what happened to me, no one believed me. And, you know, it was the whole blame game obviously happened. And instead of, you know, having people there to support me and believe me, it was, oh, well, you weren't with this person, like, willingly. Why did you do that? Why did you drink? Why did you do this? And again, that, that's the issue, right? That, you know, the questions are always toward the survivor. They're not towards the perpetrator. Um, and that's what I've noticed, you know, across the board is that um, people ask, you know, are you sure, you know, that this happened? Are you sure that, um, you know, you were assaulted or harassed or whatever? And it's, it's disgusting, honestly. You know, it, when when a survivor comes out with such a hard thing to talk about either way, you know, not having, you know, anyone to believe you and think that you're doing it for attention, um, not only does it deepen the trauma that, you know, you're already experiencing, but it also makes other people that have been affected by something like this not want to come out and, and say it at all. Because at the end of the day, like, they're just going to think, who's going to believe me? There's no reason for me to come out if no one's going to, you know, support me or anything. And so, yeah, I mean, there's there was really nothing in place until about maybe 2019. And you said that the change happened because, like, a, a reputable dance team was um, sort of named as being an issue? Mm-hmm, Absolutely. What was that like process like? What was it like to be witnessing that? On one hand, it was, you know, one of those things where it was like, okay, you know, finally someone's saying something. But on the other hand, I, I, I don't know if, you know, the sentiment is shared. Um, but for me, I was honestly kind of disappointed because, like I said, I had been talking about this for five, six years prior, and I'm sure there were other people that were talking about it too, you know, and I'm sure that I'm sure this conversation was happening in other places, but the fact that it took that long for, pe for people to actually get up wake up and do something to me that's really disappointing because you know you had all this time to be an ally and you chose not to you made a conscious choice not to 
you know, be there for someone that needed it versus, you know, be there for people, whether that's because of their talent or their popularity, just to, you know, preserve their place on the dance circuit. Right. Yeah, I can imagine that being frustrating, that it took that amount of time. Yeah, absolutely. It was it was very, very frustrating because by this point, especially like he, I, I had heard a lot more stories um, while the person on the other side is living their life like nothing ever happened. Um, it's hard. And especially, you know, because I've been through it, it's harder because, you know, once you've been through something like that, you don't want somebody else to go through what you went through. And unfortunately, you know, seeing so many other people go through it, 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 it kind of makes you relive what happened to you. Yeah. Um, like, what kind of support do you wish you had had, like, back in 2014? And, like, what kind of support are you excited to be able to give survivors now? Honestly, I think, and this this may sound, you know, very, very simple to people, but just being told, I believe you, and I'm with you, that's all I really wanted back then, is for someone to just stop and say, I understand what you're going through. Um, but now that I'm a part of this change um one you know one thing that I'm really excited to kind of um and this is this is a little bit in the future that we're kind of you know trying to do this but um having you know survivor like workshops and stuff like that and really like um not providing professional therapy but at least providing survivors a place to speak um a place to um, vent a place to feel like they actually belong. Um, you know, looking back, I was, I was 19 when I, you know, went through this and I can honestly say like, if, if I had that at 19, I, I would have been a much stronger 19 year old and, you know, to, 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 ha to have an ability to take back that accountability and say it doesn't matter what social standing that you have on the circuit, you will be held responsible for your actions. I think that as a survivor is a great feeling, but now as an advocate, that's an even better feeling. Yeah. So um, you talked a, um, a bit about like how, like what happens when a survivor um, shares their story and like they aren't believed um, by the circuit. Mm -hmm. What kinds of like factors or like places make the actual circuit itself a place where sexual violence occurs? So I think, you know, a lot of the incidents that I've heard of happened at like after parties and stuff like that, um, which I think, you know, kind of if we, if we think about it in the, in the sense of, okay, well, where do these things happen? I don't necessarily think that that's enough to think, to kind of focus on. Mm -hmm. um, and the reason I say that is because, like, you know, it doesn't necessarily take a specific event or, you know, um, place for something like this to take place. I feel like it just takes one person with wrong intentions um, to make something like this happen or one person that doesn't understand um the boundaries of consent um so when i kind of you know think of that question I, I don't you know necessarily limit it to one place i just always feel like it just takes that one person that wants to cause harm to somebody else whether that's knowingly or unknowingly you know because you know I hear a lot of oh well this person didn't understand that what they were doing to the other person was you know considered sexual violence in any way yeah well 
if the other person is saying no, that immediately puts you in the wrong. No means no. And I and it doesn't take an environment to determine that. The reason I look at it this way is because for me, until it's fixed, it's still broken. Mm-hmm. Um and you know, I appreciate progress. I appreciate seeing boards, you know, take small actions in, in the right step in the right direction. But until you know, there is proper accountability, there is proper, you know, guidelines, there is proper support. Um, to me, the circuit will still be broken until all of those things are in place. And until then, for me, it doesn't matter where in the circuit you are, whether that's at an after party, a mixer, a competition, it, it will still be just as unsafe. How has that been to like sit with that? Like, especially when like thinking about like how you thought about the circuit before you were on it. You know, I I went into the circuit with a lot of hope, Um, you know, and then I think being pretty young when this happened, um, you know, it ruins your whole view of basically an organization and a group of people that you really, really look looked up to. Um, because, you know, for me, I joined the dance circuit because I admired the art of mm-hmm. dance. And, you know, not knowing that this sort of culture exists underneath the surface because, you know, what you're shown about the circuit is that everyone is inherently good and that the culture is inherently accepting and everybody's supposed to turn into your family somehow Mm. and then being you know faced with this it's a really hard smack in the face um you know i honestly think and I, i like i said before i think a lot of it has turned me into a very pessimistic person in the sense that when when I, you know, see things happening now, um, whether that's, you know, change-wise or anything, I kind of sit back and I just think, well, how long is this going to last? Is this actually going to stick? And, you know, I want to be hopeful. I want to, you know, say that, this is going to work this time. This is, you know, the thing that it's going to take for people to start realizing that what's happening is wrong. But in actuality, I have really no idea. You know, I'm just trying like so many other people are now. Right. Well, you know, I know that SVR um, is going to be a really important part of making sure that like, perpetrators are held accountable and that survivors have spaces to be heard. Um, But what are some things that you think need to happen or that you can make happen to make sure that the circuit itself is safe? How do we get to that point? I think the first thing is really just saying things as they are. Um, The circuit has a habit like I said, of, you know, keeping people on that should not be there or, you know, their actions because of their actions. And I think there needs to be a very strict policy on that as to if you are, you know, caught doing something like this to somebody, if a report is made, um, whether that be from a competition, a team, an individual, whatever, it needs to be taken seriously. And, y- you know, this this concept of belief, of believing someone when something happens, it, it seems very small. But, you know, that's where the change really starts. Because how do you change something if you don't even believe that it happened? Right? So 
for one, I think, start believing survivors. They, survivors literally get nothing out of saying that something like this happened to them. They tell their stories over and over again. They relive their trauma over and over again, just so someone will hear them. They're not getting anything out of that. It it takes so much out of survivors to constantly have to tell that story, constantly hoping someone will believe them. And so literally, I think first things first, like just believe people when they say this to you. Second thing I can say is if it's, you know, whether it's a team, whether it's a um, competition board, whether it's, you know, a few individuals, whatever, set up some sort of support system for them. Whether that's, you know, trying to help them find therapy, whether that's taking them to you know, local authorities to, you know, report the incident if that's what they want. Do that. Become the tools and the resources that this person needs to get to a place of healing. You know, I'm not even talking about accountability yet because unfortunately, like, for me, the... The mental health and the emotional health and the physical health of the survivor is what comes first. We will absolutely, you know, have a chance to deal with the perpetrator. And I want to see that happen. But I don't want that to happen at the cost of the survivor's mental, emotional and physical health. Yeah. Knowing now, like, what you know about the community, even it, as it is changing, mm-hmm. um, is there something that you would, like, want to say or, like, a message you want to give to, like, folks who are just now entering the circuit? Absolutely. So, for a very long time, I feel like I have, you know, begged people to be allies. And I want to take back that statement. And there's a very simple reason why. If you're an ally for, you know, what's happening and you want to be there for survivors, that's great. No doubt about it. That is wonderful that you want to be there for people. But at the same time, I don't want people to be allies, just allies anymore. Mm-hmm. I want them to be enemies of this, this whole system that has built survivors like me. Because I shouldn't have to be coming like anywhere saying that this is wrong. People should know right from wrong. But unfortunately, that's not the case. And, you know, I I want people to be enemies of the society, of the cultural, cultural norms, of the system that has justified all of this. And, you know, like, it's, it's, it's very easy to say it's, it's harder to survive it, but it's even harder to actually go do something about it and hope that something actually happens from that. Well, I think that's a really wonderful note to end on. Vedahi, thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing with us. Thank you so much for having me. I really, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and be able to share this space with you.